Welcome, everybody, to our uh, fantastic colloquium. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're super excited for today. We're going to hang out till about uh, 10 after, so another, uh, whatever, seven or so minutes. Um, as always, get comfortable. Uh, if you need a juice or stretch or coffee. Eric, or you, you sound like one of these TV announcers. I know. I've been told... <laughs> Stretch the time, stretch it out, stretch it out. <laughs> no, because I don't know about your world, but I'm in so many Zoom meetings. I appreciate a little break where someone's like, hey, uh, there's actually nothing required for the next couple of minutes. Okay, now I'm living with uh, two computers because I need one for the uh, introduction where it's all written out for me and the other for the uh, webinar. I don't know how I could live without two. Probably soon I'll need three. The local report, hopefully anyone that's in Berkeley has taken a chance to go see the cherry blossom trees down at the west side of campus. They're absolutely gorgeous and in full bloom right now. If you happen to be local, you know, exercise, take a walk, bike ride, whatever. It's So what's the cross street? The west side, uh, oh, the west side would be down uh, by Oxford Street. Right. Yeah, exactly. Sort of coming, if you come straight up university and kind of, yeah. I, I have one noticed. in my house, so I don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> okay. Or there's also a field trip to Laura's house as part mm -hmm. of the programming. Not only serious workout, you have to go up a big hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed seeing you were very good about taking photos of your um your kind of group as it grew over the years. And I, I, I really love seeing that. I wish I had the foresight of taking these annual pictures. Oh, on my website. That yeah, is I don't know where I stumbled on that, but it was some really, really um, touching. On our website, that is thanks to Andy and Mickey took those for the first couple of years. And then I just kept it up. <laughs> it's it's uh, quite good. And uh, how many uh, are there in your group now? Now I think there's 17. Um, Ooh, that's a big I've responsibility. Yeah, I've got a, a bunch of people graduating soon. So sad. <laughs> and I just heard an update from my very first PhD student. It's so nice to hear from former students. <laughs> yes. And, the, and by the way, have you noticed how incredibly successful they all are? Yeah. The, the reason is that you have to be really smart to get into Berkeley in the first place. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So those, those really smart people are likely to be successful in life. <laughs> Yeah, I just experienced my, uh, I think, second Zoom wedding with a friend over the COVID quarantine. I don't know how many people experience these kind of life events. A friend just said, we're not waiting. We're doing it. Tune in. Here's the link. I have not seen that yet. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Something a little different, but, you know, times are changing. Yeah, I took my first flight uh, this uh, past uh, weekend. Oh. And... Uh, I, I stopped at a shop in the airport and paid cash. It's the first time I used cash in a year. <laughs> I haven't been to the airport in yeah, and, well over a year. <laughs> and then I, I was on a plane that was essentially completely full. And I didn't think twice about it because I'm vaccinated. Right. Well, our nanny is vaccinated and she got COVID. Okay. But I assume she must have had a very mild case. She did. But you can pass it to other people. So it's a little... <laughs> Yeah. Right. But the other people should also be vaccinated. Right. Yeah, if you're hanging out with all vaccinated people, I guess it's fine. Well, I, I hung out on an airplane with 160 people. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not worried. I'm going to forget how to how to travel after all of this. Yeah, it's, it's, it, uh, it doesn't come back completely. There's certain things you have to try to remember. My uh, cash story was a couple of weeks ago, I happened to be out 
and went to an ATM. For some reason, I thought I should pull out cash because I hadn't used it in forever, but somehow felt like what you're supposed to do. And so I went and used the ATM and immediately my card was flagged. It was unusual activity. My card was locked up. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, I haven't pulled out cash in whatever, a million years. So that's very unusual. Good algorithm, but uh, you should take context into account in the calculation. So. So folks, I just want to remind people that are that are coming in when we when we start, um, we you, you feel free to type questions into the chat um, and we'll try to handle them um, probably near the end. And we're happy to um, kind of bring you into the panel so that you can ask your question live and have some more interaction with our amazing speaker today. So since we're getting very close to uh, starting time, uh, let me uh, just get going. And I'd like to uh, uh, introduce our speaker today. Uh, before I do that, I just want to mention next week's speaker. So next week, uh, we're going to have uh, Chris Ermson, uh, who is the, um, uh, the leader of Aurora, which is the company that seems to have consolidated all the self-driving automobile research. So that should be an interesting uh, colloquium next week. So for this week, we're very lucky to have Professor Laura Waller. Uh, and I'm just very impressed with Laura in that uh, she is, does everything on her own and, and is made, chooses all her own topics and figures everything out. And uh, she is, um, uh, she's essentially created her own specialty. She leads the computational imaging uh, lab, which develops methods for optical imaging and uh, with uh, computational algorithms uh, designed uh, jointly with the imaging methods. And I would say that uh, her timing was impeccable in the sense that as she grew up uh, through her uh, uh, PhD education, uh, the field became uh, hotter and hotter and became uh, the, probably uh, the most important field in computer science today. She holds the uh, Ted Van Duzer Endowed Professorship and is a uh, senior fellow at the Berkeley Institute of Data Science. Uh, and uh, she has affiliations in bioengineering and applied science and technology. She was a uh, postdoctoral researcher and physics lecturer at Princeton University and uh, received uh, BS and M and MNG and PhD degrees from MIT. Uh, she's a Moore Foundation data-driven investigator, uh, Baker Fellow, Distinguished Graduate Student Mentoring Awardee, NSF Career Awardee, Chan Zuckerberg Biohub Investigator and Awardee, SPIE Early Career Achievement Awardee, and uh, Packard Fellow. So uh, with that a fantastic uh, list of achievements, uh, let me introduce uh, Laura. Thanks. And I'm sharing my screen now, hopefully you can see. Um, but feel free to interrupt with questions. Um, I'm going to keep the chat open, but it's hard for me to follow it. Um, same with Q&A, but you can interrupt if you want, if there's a way to interrupt or put your hand up or ask the moderators. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about our work in computational imaging and particularly computational microscopy. So uh, computational imaging is has a, a bunch of groups working on this topic. And uh, as Eli mentioned, it's kind of an up and coming field because we, like, we've been having optical designers work on optical design and imaging system hardware for literally centuries. But um, only recently have we had the computational power to like bring the computer into the mix and make it a, a powerful part of that imaging system. And so computational imaging is about using like computation and algorithms like in sync with your hardware designs and optical, optical hardware uh, and devices uh, in order to do things that you couldn't do with just one or the other. So uh, one of the new and most exciting parts of computational imaging now is this thinking about data-driven design. And this is really about like uh, 
normal computational imaging systems, you design some hardware and you take a picture or a bunch of pictures and they may not look anything like your, what you're trying to reconstruct, but then you do some, solve some algorithm and reconstruct the image that you want. So tomography is a great example of this. Whereas with data-driven design, now we can start thinking about putting the algorithm into the hardware design as well, and not just relying on expertise or this black art uh, magic, but figuring out how to, uh, uh, to like theoretically optimize your imaging hardware. And this has only sort of recently become possible because it requires a lot of computation. Um, so let me give you a canonical example and I'll follow this thread through the whole talk. Um, so this is a lensless camera. It's literally just a camera that you remove the lens and you have a sensor and you point it at the world and take a picture. Um, so that picture looks like garbage because you didn't have a lens there to form the image. Uh, but the, the lens that forms the image, its only job is to bend the light rays. And so it's the same light hitting the sensor now that would have hit the sensor if uh, I had a lens forming an image of the scene. So you can kind of think about theoretically, could I take this image and then reconstruct the scene from it since it's the same light? And the answer is basically no. Um, but we have this version of it, of this lensless camera called the Fuser Cam where we put in one piece of hardware, it's not a lens, it's this bumpy piece of plastic and it's really close to the sensor. It's just like, maybe like the stickers that you put on your window for privacy glass, that's what we sometimes use. And you just stick it on top of the cover glass of your sensor, take a picture, looks like garbage, but now it's structured garbage that we can reconstruct with our image with. Okay, so let's think about how this compares to a regular camera. Um, a regular camera has some lens or a set of lenses that map a point in your scene uh, to a point, oops, uh, to a point on your sensor. And so uh, if you think about like, what does a point in the scene do to like your measurement? Well, your measurement is just the point. And we call this this point spread function. It's the exact same idea as the impulse function in signal processing. On our diffuser cam, a point in the scene spreads out light across the whole diffuser uh, the diffuser actually has a little aperture here. And then uh, the diffuser is this bumpy piece of plastic. And so you get random focusing of the light that goes through it. And our point spread function becomes this very large thing that has all kinds of like randomness, uh, random focusing within it. We call this a caustic pot pattern. It's like what you see at the bottom of a swimming pool on a hot day because you have a random surface shape of a refractive element. So uh, you can make this uh, with really cheap stuff like double-sided scotch tape and, and the Raspberry Pi sensor. And we have on our open source uh, section of our website, we have a tutorial so you can build this at home with your kids. Uh, we've had a lot of friends and, and other and engineers build this for fun and send us pictures. If you build one, send us some of your pictures. It's not a good camera, but it's fun. Um, and we have all the code there so you don't have to write the, the reconstruction algorithm yourself. But I'm gonna teach you how the reconstruction algorithm works in case you wanna write it yourself. Okay, so uh, if I think about this point source in the world and it maps this caustic pattern, this is what happens when I move that point source laterally. That caustic pattern shifts. If I turn on two point sources at once, then I get the linear sum of the shifted caustic patterns or point spread functions. So this is a linear system in intensity, we're measuring intensity. Um, and so we can write it as like y equals ax, a linear system. Uh, so this is uh, more a representation of a regular camera where your measurement is the picture you took and x is your scene that you're trying to take a picture of. Um, and then this A matrix represents your forward model or your system function. Basically how, uh, how every point in the scene maps to a point on the sensor and uh, with traditional optical design, people are trying to make this A matrix as close as possible to the identity matrix. And that's how you define like a metric for how good your camera is, is how well does it exactly replicate what's out in the world onto my sensor. When we're talking about computational cameras, things are very different. And you might have an A matrix, something like this, that looks just totally random, but it's still a linear system that the scene out in the world X is still mapped by this linear system A into your measurements Y. So these measurements Y are like linear combinations all of, of all the different point spread functions from different points in the world. Um, and they're all jumbled together, but 
if we know this A matrix and it's invertible, then we can solve this Y equals AX problem and reconstruct the scene. So actually the hard part of this project is that we need to know this forward model. Um, and you have a couple choices. We could measure it. So the brute force way would be to go put a point in your scene, measure the system response or point spread function for that point, and just drop it into one of these columns of the A matrix, move the point over here to take another column of the A matrix and just go through, right, maybe raster scan through the entire scene and take all of the responses of the system to every point in the scene. And that is your A matrix. So basically measuring the A matrix column by column. Uh, this is super infeasible because we have like multi megapixel sensors. You would need a precise motion stage to move that thing around the scene. You just wouldn't be able to build this at home with your kids. Um, but it also, it would require a huge calibration effort um, that, and a lot of memory to store all of this. So we could model this A matrix. If we knew the surface shape of the diffuser, we could predict how light propagates through the system, but we don't know the surface shape of the diffuser and we don't want you have to go measure these like surface, uh, surface profiles that are only like tens of microns tall. Uh, that's also too difficult to do. We can mach machine learn the whole thing black box style. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but in practice what we do is a combination of all three of these things that results in a really simple calibration. And our calibration is just to take, put a point source in the world. So take my iPhone flashlight and just hold it far away from my camera and take a picture of this caustic pattern, and that's enough uh, to calibrate this system. So why is that enough? Well, basically, as my point source moves in the scene uh, or shifts laterally, then this caustic pattern is shifting laterally. That means that this is a shift invariant system, uh, which means that this A matrix is actually a convolution matrix. Um, if you're not familiar with convolutions, Basically, it just means that every column in this A matrix is the same as the previous one, but shifted by a certain amount. So this caustic pattern here at one point is the point spread uh, function response of the system at one position in the scene. And at some other position, it's simply shifted version of the same thing. It actually is also cropped as it goes off the edge of the sensor. I'm just gonna ignore that, but we do need to take that into account in our algorithm. So this A matrix being uh, convolutional means that we don't need to measure the whole thing. We just need to measure one column. Hence, we just need one point spread function response and we can predict the response at all other point spread functions. Uh, it also means we don't have to ever instantiate this matrix, which would be humongous. It would be like a megapixel by a megapixel at least, and we don't need to invert it because uh, we can do a simple inversion with FFTs for deconvolution. So here's our raw data and then the reconstructed image. Um, and here's another image. And I wanna talk a little bit about the algorithm. So I said it's a convolution, but we solve it as a big optimization problem. So why is our measured image? Um, a is this, this convolution forward model. So this will be a convolution here. And we try to minimize the difference between the measurement and the expected measurement. That's pretty standard. Uh, we apply a positivity constraint saying that there is no negative intensity because that's non-physical. And then we have this extra term here. Lambda is controlling how strong this term is, uh, but it's imposing a sparsity constraint. Um, you can think of this as a regularizer that's in the 2D case, it's just, uh, it's just uh, doing some noise, uh, just trying to kill some noise basically. But it's enforcing sparsity in that the, uh, that the scene should have some structure and should be sparse in some basis set we just tried a bunch uh, to see which ones work well, or we know which ones work well for natural scenes. Um, so Laura, we... excuse me, can you explain what is a regularizer? Uh, so regularizer is basically, it's like the name you give for like a constraint like this. So, so this would be the problem we're trying to solve. Um, and this is kind of like a tune, a regularizer is kind of like a tunable constraint. Um, or it's not even a totally constraint because this lambda won't be like a very high value maybe. It's just sort of like pushing your solution towards the one that has a uh, high sparsity in this case. So here we're using like L1 sparsity. We're trying to say like the scene is mostly zeros or the gradient of the scene is mostly zero. That, so total variation is the regularizer we use, which is to say that um, if you take the gradient of this scene, which is X, 
then it should be sparse. And so like the, the higher this Lambda number is, the more it's trying to force that to be true, to find the solution that has, uh, that has the sparsest solution. So um, is Lambda so, like a Lagrange multiplier? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, like mathematically, they're very similar, right? So um, yes. So regularizers usually, I think, apply, like you would call it that when you're trying to like tweak basically or like uh, push your solution towards something else. You're not forcing it necessarily. Um, other people might argue. So you can force, force the solution to be the sparse solution with this as well. So it's something that's used in optimization. It's fantastic that you saw, you've uh, converted a problem in linear algebra into an optimization problem. Yeah, so um, by putting it as this optimization problem, you can kind of just like plug and play, drop whichever regularizer you want, which is sort of what we did. We just tried a few of them. So this total variation one works well, but you can also just say that the scene itself is sparse. It's mostly zeros and see if that works. And on some scenes that'll work better. So there is some black magic in trying to figure out which regularizer to use. Um, I'm still talking about like 2D reconstruction of images where we're reconstructing the same number of pixels we measured. And so this is just sort of like pushing the solution around. When I get later to compress sensing, it's helping us find a solution in the first place that would otherwise be impossible. So it's imposing constraints that reduce the solution space sufficiently enough that we can find a solution. And so that's, uh, that's like a pretty different, um, a pretty different goal, but totally same math and same algorithm. Thank you. All right, so this is like the optimization way of solving this, um, or I call it like the physics-based reconstruction method. So you take your measurement and you put it in as the input, basically Y is the input here, and it spits out an output X, which is your final image after you solve this optimization problem. So I said, we use ADMM, it's just a popular optimization solver that works well for this. Um, but it solves this optimization problem iteratively by doing a bunch of iterations and, and continuously updating the estimate of this X until it thinks it has a good one. The other way to do this is to just black box machine learn it and throw in a whole bunch of measurements and known images as training pairs and train a big neural network that can do the same thing. And you just let the network figure it all out. So you don't tell the network any of the physics, you just let it figure it all out itself. And you just have to give it a lot of input output training pairs um, to get an, and get an appropriately deep network that it can actually figure this out. Um, so this is kind of like a trend in computational imaging is to try to machine learn things. And there can be some, some advantages, some disadvantages. So I'll call like our optimization based stuff, our physics based solvers like ADMM, FIST is another popular one. Uh, deep learning is the other way to go. So throwing it at a, a neural network. And I can think of some, like for our case, different pros and cons. So the physics-based way is pretty interpretable and robust, but it's slow. And when that, that forward model, the A matrix is an approximation or is somehow like not quite correct because maybe we have misalignment or something else, then it can cause some weird artifacts. Um, deep learning has a big advantage that it's faster, that once you've trained the network, actually like running something through the network is almost always going to be orders of magnitude faster than running these iterative algorithms. And that's a big one for us, um, but it is so not interpretable. Who knows what kind of weird artifacts it's going to get out and you don't know where they came from. So you don't know what to expect, which is kind of dangerous in my mind. So what we were trying to do is find this middle ground in between where we are using the physics we know rather than just black box trying to get a neural network to learn physics that we already know. Like we built the thing, we know what it's supposed to do. So let's put that in as information um, and try to get a sort of like uh, something that, that uses a neural network, but a really efficient neural network. And essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that the architecture of the neural network is gonna be defined by the physics of the system so that it's embedded into the neural network so that it becomes really efficient. And what we get out of it 
is that we can have smaller networks um, and far, far less training data, like several orders of magnitude, less training data to get good results. And we can get some of these benefits of the neural network being faster um, and helping to get rid of artifacts in some cases. So let's use what we know and learn what we do not know. So here's how Christina did this for this particular diffuser cam case. She feeds it in the measured calibration image, which is the point spread function. So that's something you would just do once and then store it. And then she feeds it in the input image. And uh, she makes a neural network where each layer of this network uh, basically does all of the operations of one iteration of our usual iterative algorithm, ADMM. And so like, if you did nothing, if you just put in our, our usual algorithm, you would just, this would just be like a neural network way of doing exactly what we were already doing. But now she can tweak and tune, she can learn different aspects of, of, the, uh, of the algorithm. Like she can learn all these hyperparameters like that Lambda that I showed you in the algorithm. There's actually a lot of them that we can learn. We can also throw a unit at the end. So basically this does like uh, optimizing the regularizers and optimizing the algorithm. Uh, and then you can throw a unit at the end that can try to learn some of the weird artifacts that weren't explainable um, because we are going to put some input output ground truth pairs here, but not very many. Okay, so I want to show you that this is a good way to go. Here's our ground truth image. Here's the optimization based way of doing things or the physics based model based way of doing things. It has artifacts and it's slow. The totally deep learning way of doing things has artifacts and it's fast. And this hybrid way of doing things is fairly fast and has the best quality images. So I think this is a really nice example of where machine learning can work together with physics um, to get the best of both worlds. Okay, so I've been talking about this, this like cute trick where we put a diffuser on a sensor and use it as a camera but it's not something that's really gonna replace your iPhone camera. Uh, we're not even close to the quality of a photography camera. We could try to get there, but that's like not the direction we wanted to go in. So we wanted to start thinking about things that these kind of cameras can do that a regular camera simply cannot do. And 3D is a great example. So if you think about a regular camera, it has a focus plane and things that are out of focus are blurred and the information is lost when they're blurred. And so you just can't get that information back. People in computer vision have been trying for a very long time. But if you think about a lensless camera like this, uh, it doesn't have a focus plane. There is no lens, so there is no focus plane. And so what it has is just a different response from different depths. And what you can see here is as I move that point source to different depths, the system response, which is the intensity we measure at the sensor or the point spread function, it's basically the same caustic pattern, but it's scaling with depth. So now it shifts laterally uh, with lateral shifts and it scales with depth. So from one single calibration measurement, I can actually predict the response of the system to every point in a 3D volume, which means I have a chance to do 3D imaging. Okay, so the 3D imaging problem, we're gonna set it up very similar to the 2D one. We're still gonna take a single measurement image. So I have 1 million here, cause say it was a one megapixel camera, that's actually super low megapixels for camera. Then I want to now solve for X, which is now a volume. So the volume has a million pixels at every layer. And I'm just assuming say I have a hundred layers. So I'm now trying to solve for a hundred million things from a single measurement of a million pixels. And so this A matrix is extremely, um, fat and short uh, because it's severely underdetermined problem. And basically each block of this A matrix is a convolution because it represents the point spread function, the shift invariant point spread function at a given depth. And the one at the next depth is the same, it's just scaled. So this like convolution model and the scaling just wildly improves the calibration that we would have to do if, it if we didn't have this property. Uh, it also drastically improves computation. We're not going to try to invert this A matrix. Doing like a pseudo inverse of this kind of an A matrix would be uh, pretty insane computationally because it's huge. Um, and so the fact that we can treat it as convolutions is a really big deal for computation. But we're still left with a pretty major problem that we have about a factor of 100 uh, underdetermined system. And so we're trying to solve for 100 times more things than we measured. This should be impossible but images are compressible. 
Um, and you know from photography, you take a picture in your camera and then you store it on your computer and do some compression algorithm and you come out with uh, some picture or some representation of the picture that has a lot less pixels, but fully represents all of the information in that image. So uh, it means that some of the information in your image was redundant. Um, and really it just means your image has structure. It's not totally random noise. And this is the case for everything that we're gonna look at. So the fact that you can compress images is nice, but compression is almost always done in post-processing after the fact. So we're gonna get into compress sensing, which is all about, can we compress the data in the capture stage? So rather than take an image and then compress it to a smaller data set, why don't we just collect that smaller data set? And the problem is you don't know in what way it's compressible. Uh, you don't know how to capture like the coefficients of the compression, which is what, exactly what we want to do here. So uh, this is not something that's super new actually. Compressed sensing has been around for a while and it's this beautiful theory that you can solve severely underdetermined problems uniquely um, by introducing a sparsity prior. So that regularizer I showed you earlier, that is a sparsity prior. Um, it says that uh, I'm trying to constrain the solution to one that is sparse. And by doing that, uh, if you know the object is sparse, then compressed sensing says you should get the right answer. Um, compressed sensing in the real world is a little bit messier um, and we can't capture the data in the like perfect mathematical way. So uh, it's a sliding scale, but I wanna show you that this system is already amenable to compressed sensing because not only does the, the image have to be compressible, but you also have to capture the data in a way that uh, I'm gonna call it multiplexing. And it's this idea that, um, that you have to capture linear combinations of parts of the data so that when you throw away some data, you still have information from, from the rest of the images. So our system does this. A point in the scene maps to a lot of pixels on the sensor, this big caustic pattern. And that is good for compressed sensing because it means that when I delete some of the pixels on the sensor, I still have other pixels that have information from that point. And so I haven't lost all of the information from that point which is not what would happen if you were in a regular camera with sort of one-to-one -one mapping of points. If you deleted a pixel, you just lose the information from that position. So this spreading out of light is actually a really good thing for compressed sensing. And we need it to be able to do this compressed sensing. So let me show you- May I ask another question? Sure. I'm looking at the license plate and I see that sparse because it's either the, the white between the numbers uh, or it's the, uh, the dark of the numbers themselves. And uh, the only information is in the edges. Uh, so even though it's, it's, it's two dimensional, uh, there's actually uh, probably only one dimensional information there. Um, yeah, so this would be really good for what I call the TV sparsity. So if you took the gradient of it, this image, there's yeah. gonna be a lot of zeros in the gradient, right? Exactly, exactly. Now on the, on the other hand, I look at the picture of the girl with the uh, toy and uh, well, there's a lot of black background uh, but there's a lot of uh, uh, different shades in her uh, complexion and so forth. Seems like that's a little bit harder. Uh, right. So it's actually a little bit surprising to me that actually this TV, like the gradient sparsity works very well on these kinds of images, even though they have like gradients all over the place. Um, so I think you will see like this image would do better. You could use, you could like push it further. Um, like you could take even less data with an image like this, I believe. Um, but images like this still work very well with gradient sparsity. So it's, um, it's, it's quite, it, it's a tribute to the compressibility of images. Right. And yeah, so you can also yeah. think about like percentage sparsity, right? Like this image might be like 98% sparse, whereas this one's only 85. I have no idea what the actual values are, but yeah. So uh, that's like, how far can you push it? So I'm going to just show you basically take this raw image throw away 80% of the pixels and we still get a pretty good reconstruction. Um, so if we throw away 90% or even 98%, we can still get something out of it, but you see it is degrading as we reduce the, the amount of data. Um, so like an image like this maybe would just do, do just fine with just 2% of the, the data. So it's a very, um, I'll say it's a very nonlinear problem in that it's, it depends on what you're trying to image. How well it works depends on what you're trying to image. And that has been a pretty big problem for trying to develop systems and characterize them when, when 
how well it works depends on what you're imaging to start with. So in this case, you threw away 98% of the pixels, but the remaining pixels, I kind of have a feeling that they're uh, measured extremely accurately, that you have, uh, you have a, a big demand on signal to noise ratio. Is that um, true? Yeah, so, so uh, you'll be more sensitive to signal to noise if you throw away 98% of your data, absolutely. I'm gonna talk about the implications of that actually a little bit later um, for our system, but that's like part of the trade-off. So you can solve this underdetermined system, but you've taken less data and so it will be more susceptible to noise. And it's also more susceptible to like other errors like uh, misalignment, et cetera. Um, Please go ahead. All right, so uh, this is the case where you like took a 2D image and then threw away information, but that's not a good idea. And so uh, I just wanted to show you that the system itself is amenable to compressed sensing. But what we're really gonna use the compressed sensing for is to take a 2D image with say a million pix pixels and reconstruct a 3D image with say 500 million voxels. Uh, in this case, we're reconstructing 128 depth planes um, each one with the full set of, of pixels that you would have in the regular image. And this is a little, there's a little leaf, you're seeing the 3D reconstruction of it spinning. So you get a sense that there is depth information there, that we are getting 3D information from this single like blurry image, blurry looking, it looks blurry, but it has a lot of high spatial frequency information if you zoom in on it. Okay, so what I was really excited, like this is all like uh, kind of like computational imaging tricks but we want to actually use this for like real world stuff. Um, and since we work in microscopy, uh, this seemed like a great application in microscopy for going after problems where you're trying to image across a really big volume, but also with high resolution. So it means you're trying to resolve a lot of pixels and the, the number of pixels you're trying to resolve can be represented by the space bandwidth product. So if I want to resolve a lot of pixels, I have a high space bandwidth product. And normally, um, how fast you can image them depends on how many things you want to image. So if you're doing a point scanning method like confocal microscopy, you have to scan a point across the whole 3D space. If you want to scan more points in 3D, it's gonna take longer, right? Um, or you can scan planes. So you go a little faster, but you get worse resolution usually. So light field microscopy was an example of a single shot 3D microscope, which is really exciting but it had horrible resolution uh, because they were trying to spread the 3D across, the whole, across a 2D sensor and you have this problem of mismatched dimensionalities. And so they were giving up resolution on order of like, at least an order of magnitude. And like, that's the whole point of using a microscope is to get resolution. And so people weren't really willing to give it up. So now with this diffuser cam, we're in this realm where um, how well we can do along the, we're always doing fast, right? So we always have single shot. Um, but how well we can do for space bandwidth product just depends on sparsity. So if you know if you just had a single point in 3D space, you can get a huge space bandwidth product. Like you can have a huge number of voxels as long as only one of them is on. And the more that are on, um, the, the sort of the lower you go along here. But uh, typical samples like fluorescent samples usually are very compressible. And so you can do quite well in this, this sort of space bandwidth product uh, realm while also being single shot. Um, and this is really exciting because now your speed is not scaling with the number of things you want to image, but actually the number of important things you want to image. And so one of the big applications we've pursued here is being able to put these uh, in animals to image their neural activity because neural activity is fast. So it happens about the time scale of uh, 50 frames per second camera, which is no problem for a sensor. Um, so as long as you can do 3D with each frame, then you're, you're good on speed and they need 3D because they're trying to track which neurons are connected to which other neurons and which ones are firing at a given time. And you need to be able to do that dynamically and in 3D because all of these neurons are just like jumbled around mushed up in 3D space. So here's one of our first experiments doing that. This is the, the 3D reconstruction of a zebrafish brain. You can see the two side lobes of the, of the brain. And each of these dots represents one of the neurons that we detected. And then the color over time represents its activity at that given time. So this one's not doing anything exciting, uh, but we work closely with some neuroscientists who are using these kinds of systems to try to track uh, specific networks of neurons. And we can also control which ones fire at given times. And then we see which ones they're connected to by what else fires. Um, and uh, 
if you want to hear more about that, you can look for Hillel Desnick's talks because he does all of the actual neuroscience with this. And we just help with the technology. So here's the flat version. It's just a sensor um, with some, some color filters because we're doing fluorescence microscopy. And here's the zebrafish and you can see neural activity in its brain. Uh, and we're getting single neuron resolution here. So we can say this neuron fired or this other neuron fired at a given time, which is really exciting. So this like flat microscope was kind of like our goal, but it had so many problems. Like these color filters don't work well when you try to make everything flat and compact. And so we actually kind of switched around to building um, more of like just a miniature microscope. And these miniature microscopes are super popular in neuroscience. They also can be done sort of much, much deeper within the brain because they have this grin, the, the objective lens on the microscope is this grin lens that can be actually implanted into the mouse's brain. So you can watch neurons that are very deep within the brain. Um, and so it's just this like, uh, tiny microscope, it's smaller than a quarter. This is the whole thing here. And uh, we inserted this phase mask. It's our basically our diffuser, we're calling it a phase mask because it's now an engineered designed phase mask that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and we put this in the, the back of the pupil plane of, of this tiny microscope so that we can have these things head mounted so the mice can run around and perform tasks. And you know, like we feed them and they go around a maze or something like that. Again, that's Hillel's expertise, and we're just building the technology for it. But we're getting more than single neuron resolution here, which is what we were after, um, and in this tiny microscope factor, which had a lot of challenging engineering to go with it. But in the end, it only weighs two and a half grams. It's uh, one and a half centimeters tall, um, and it, it's not a heavy load for the, the mouse to carry around. So Laura, I'm so excited by what you're about to show us, but a couple of slides ago, you uh -huh. showed the z parts of the zebrafish glowing colors. And were those glowing colors, uh, wh where do those glowing colors come from? Uh, so those are, I can't get it to replay. So basically the color changes here, here's the color no, scale. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the next one where it, it actually glowed. Oh, here? Yeah, yeah, just the brightness is the activity. So like when you see something light up, that's a neuron firing. Right, but how do you sense that optically? Um, so these are, so these zebrafish, basically they're like uh, engineered so that when a neuron fires, it lights up. And that's like, so it's, it's really similar to optogenetics. Um, this is just calcium imaging, um, uh, but uh, you can do this with optogenetics as well. And the beauty of it is that we have separate systems in Hillel's lab that also like fire, you fire a different color at the neuron and it will fire. So if you hit the neuron with like a specific color, it fires and it lights up in a different color. And then when it, when it fires, it might cause the next one that it's connected to it to fire. So that other one also lights up and it'll light up, you know, a fraction of a second later. And so you can like, this is the experiments we're doing now is basically like um, intentionally cause certain neurons to fire and then see which other ones fire immediately afterwards and in what order, because that tells you how they're connected to each other. You can basically like map out the functional circuit map of these neurons. I'm, and I'm then, still puzzled where, where the color comes from, where that yellow uh, light um, is coming it's from. Just, so the, the color, like the, I should have a color bar here, but basically like, it's just like the brighter, the brighter the color, the brighter the light is at that yeah, point in time. If I had zebrafish in my aquarium, they, they're not going to do that. They wouldn't do that, no. So you must have done something to the zebrafish. Yeah, I didn't do anything to zebrafish. We just get them from our collaborators. But yes, and, you have to uh, gen genetically engineer them. Um, and this right. is and not so, so they, they literally produce light uh, as a result of uh, brain activity. So you can like like you can buy zebrafish that have this property, but this is not something that's going to happen in humans anytime soon. Right, right. So uh, in other words, if, with the naked eye, I'd actually see this light too. No, it's very dim. Um, and in okay, fact, that's like, good enough. Yeah, uh, I can do my dark adapted eye is, is very sensitive. Okay. Yeah. So, and so what we plot here is like the change in, it's called delta F over F. It's like the change in brightness over the baseline brightness. So um, right. you have to plot it like that because that's actually a pretty small signal. Right. So these have been genetically engineered to produce light as a result of neural activity. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so the, the, and the calcium indicators are like fluorophores. So you will like, you can like insert them in, in different things. So we use both. 
Um, okay, we're, oh, I was just gonna show it. So this is our raw video from this mini scope version. Um, and then the 3D reconstructed video. This is a little tardigrade or water bear. It's like a little caterpillar. You can see it's all its legs. And I'm just showing you a couple perspectives. You can see here like the axial resolution is not as good as the lateral resolution, which is totally normal for any kind of microscope. Um, and so we're diffraction limited at best. And so we're not gonna do better than, than that. So now I wanna get to some of the dark secrets, all the problems that we run into. And uh, we already actually talked about one. And it's this idea that compressed sensing is super efficient. And a lot of computational imaging is about making imaging systems that are extremely efficient, where every measurement you take is important. And so then every measurement you take that has error on it, that error is becomes more important. And so, um, so like we're basically eliminating all redundancy um, and that has some consequences that you're going to be like more, more fragile system. You're gonna be more susceptible to, to errors and misalignments, et cetera. And so like we're, sh we're saying that we can like among these like sort of aspects of imaging systems, speed resolution and field of view, we're saying that you don't have to trade those off one for the other, which is what you would normally have to do but you can have all three be good at once. Um, and so like, what is the price paid? And basically um, there's not too much of a price paid because compressed sensing um, is, is using this um, extra information that the object is sparse. So if your object is not sparse, this doesn't work. Um, and when I say not sparse, I mean, if your object is just a cube of totally random intensity values, this isn't gonna work. And so this only works on things that have some structure, but we never really image stuff that doesn't have structure anyways. And so that's okay. And so that's buying us a lot, which is good, but we, had, we do pay a price in terms of SNR because a point in the scene now maps to a lot of pixels on the sensor instead of just one. And so when we get hit with Poisson noise, which is proportional to the intensity um, that hits each pixel, then we're gonna get like proportionately more noise when we spread out the light. And so for this mini scope in 3D, um, we just wanted to quantify how bad that, how bad the, the noise performance is. And we compared it to the 2D version. So there's a 2D version of the mini scope. And what you see is like when you have very, very few photons, so like very noisy data, then we do worse than the 2D mini scope. Um, but as you get to like a reasonable number of photons, uh, then you're actually doing almost as well. And so the resolution is just as good. And so this seems like a pretty good trade-off to me that you're not losing too much. Um, how much sparsity do you need? These are just some simulations to give you a sense of how the error increases with sparsity, but it's extremely system dependent. It depends a lot on noise as well. And so I wouldn't take this, I wouldn't look at the numbers here to mean anything for yourself. Uh, another big issue is that this diffuser cam system, if it's just the flat version uh, without the microscope is um, very, it's non-telecentric. And so what you get is like this, like these are the basically the resolvable voxels. And so if you have your object nice and close to the sensor, then you can get nearly isotropic resolution. But as you go further and away from the sensor, you get worse and worse axial resolution. So once you get past two meters of our current design, then you're past the hyperfocal distance of, this, of the system and you have no more 3D information, which is fine. We just don't do, do that. Um, another big challenge is that, as I mentioned, the performance depends on what you're imaging. And so like typically in an imaging system, we do two point resolution. We say like, what's the resolution of your camera or your imaging system, your microscope? It's how close can I put two points and still resolve them as two separate points rather than one blob. Um, so this two point resolution is like your diffraction limited resolution. And we can achieve diffraction limited resolution for the appropriate distances. It changes with depth. Um, so this two point resolution does very well. We do very well in this metric. However, if I then put a grid of like four by four points uh, spaced by exactly the two point diffraction limited resolution, then I can't resolve them at all. And so this is not normal. So a linear imaging system, this would not happen. You do two point resolution and you say, that's the performance of my system. That's my resolution. And here I'm saying that if my object is less sparse, my resolution degrades. 
In fact, I have to go to 1.6 times the two point resolution in order to, to resolve this grid of spots. Um, so basically like this is annoying because we can't really characterize our system unless we know what we're imaging. So basically our two point resolution is only the best case scenario. And people who are doing lenses cameras should stop talking about two point resolution. <laughs> Anyone who's using a regularizer or nonlinear regularizer should, should not use two point resolution as their metric. So we tried to come up with a metric that would get the, the worst case scenario. Um, I'm not gonna get into it. You can look at the paper, but we, we talked about this local condition numbers, basically like um, uh, the, the condition number for the, for the whole system, uh, if, you, if you had the, like just the non-sparse points. And it kind of saturates to some level. Well, I showed you that 16 point grid because that's about where it doesn't get much worse than that which is good because we can kind of have a best case scenario and a worst case scenario and how sparse your object is gives you how, where it will be within that range. Um, another problem is that I made a big deal about this shift invariant model for, for the response of the, the system. But as we get closer and closer to the sensor, so in microscopy, we get more and more, uh, less and less shift uh, invariant. Um, this is why we put, if we put the microscope objective back in, we can bring it back to a shift invariant system. But just for our regular diffuser cam, what we saw is that even the regular diffuser cam is not super shift invariant at high angles. So as you go away from the center of the field of view, it's less and less shift invariant. This is kind of like a me measure of how, how similar the point spread function is at different uh, field positions. And so like uh, we could go and exhaustively measure every point it would be insane, but basically this is what we lose by using that, th this red part is what we lose by using the uh, convolution model or shift invariant model that buys us so much mathematically um, that we consider it worthwhile. So other, what you could say is just stick to 20 degrees, um, 20 degrees on either side if you wanted to, for this particular design, it will change with the diffuser cam design. Um, but we also have ways to deal with the shift invariance. So we had some severe shift invariance in, for example, that 3D mini scope. Um, and so when we use our shift invariant model, we get horrible results. But if we take a couple of calibration measurements across the field of view and use those in a new model that accounts for this shift invariance, essentially it's like convolution at the local points in the image, then we can get a much better reconstruction. Um, you can see a video here that cleans up a lot of this garbage outside. There's a microfluidic chamber with some fluorescent beads flowing through. So there shouldn't be beads outside of the, the channels here. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time, but I just want to mention that like this caustic pattern diffuser is not ideal. And we've done a lot of work to try to design the perfect diffuser. Um, so forget about pulling off the shelf, just your privacy glass sticker. Let's find the perfect surface shape and then fabricate it and use it. Um, and this was a really exciting set of projects because this is like really like where computational imaging is going. Like let's optimize the algorithm, like optimize all these regularizers, as I said, like learning the parameters of the algorithm. Um, but now we can start learning the hardware. And so we can put this all into a huge optimization problem that uh, doesn't just learn the solution, but actually learns the best hardware to give you the best solution. And so this is like a 3D volume of fluorescent beads that we are trying to reconstruct. And here you're watching iterations of our optimizer that is solving for the ideal surface shape of the diffuser. It's essentially making it into about eight micro lenses with different properties. Uh, and it's really interesting to think about why it's deciding to do that um, and how it's deciding to, to optimize this diffuser. But this is something that we're doing right now is trying to design the perfect diffusers to get the best system performance um, in all of these different situations. All right, so I'll really quickly at the end mention a couple of cool side projects that came out of this. So I've said that we can take a 2D diffuser cam measurement and reconstruct a 2D scene, or we can take a 2D measurement and reconstruct a 3D scene, but we can also take a 2D measurement and reconstruct a 3D scene that's not XYZ, but rather XY time. Um, so we do this with rolling shutter. So most camera sensors like on your iPhone, et cetera, are rolling shutter. It means it's only actually collecting one line of the image at a time. And it's just really quickly sweeping through all of the different lines of the image to collect the image. This is why sometimes on your iPhone, if you take a picture of something that's moving really fast, it'll look really weird. Um, but it means that if things are happening faster than the frame rate of the camera, 
you might miss things. So it's catching this pink dot, but it's missing some other information. If you do this with a diffuser cam, use the rolling shutter, then because of this multiplexing property, um, no matter what's happening in your scene here, it's captured, something about it is captured on the sensor. And so we can take a single raw image of a dynamic scene and then reconstruct a video from it. Um, and this is something that Nick came up with and undergraduate Patrick Orr worked on uh, for his summer project. And I thought it was so cool that they can take this one frame and reconstruct this video of the a tennis ball bouncing on a textbook, very important scientific application. Um, whereas if you try to just regularly reconstruct it, you just get motion blur here. So we're getting like 2D plus time from a single 2D image. Here's another example, Nerf dart hitting an apple sitting on a textbook. Um, and then uh, we started thinking about like, what other 3D things can we reconstruct from a 2D measurement now that we have this cool tool of compressed sensing? Uh, and Christina and my group uh, worked with Kirillos, uh, two grad students, to build this hyperspectral camera. So they had to change things around a little bit. They put a, a spectral, an array of spectral filters on in front of the sensor. Um, uh, Christina found a, a company that was really excited to work on this with us, Viavi Solutions, and they built the, the filter arrays for us. Stick it on the sensor, put the diffuser in front, take this coded measurement, solve an optimization problem that looks almost exactly like the one I showed you for the 3D case. Um, and then we can reconstruct 2D information plus uh, wavelength information, so hyperspectral. So you get a wavelength profile for every position in your 2D scene. Um, okay, so I'm gonna end here. Um, my outlook is that our hardware and our software should work together. Uh, computers and optics should talk more. Um, but also that I think a big theme in our lab is trying to push the limits of imaging without like super fancy or expensive equipment uh, or like processes because we want to democratize this stuff. We want to be able to open source our code and uh, open source the instructions for how to build these things and build them out of fairly off the shelf or commodity things so that other people can adopt our methods very easily. And that's been a really big obsession of mine through all of the projects that we've worked on. So I will end there and thank my group for doing all of this work and happy to take questions. Great, thank you. That was amazing. Um, so we're gonna. People can ask questions in the chat, or you can also uh, reach out um, by raising your hand, and we'll call on you. Um, I, I had a question actually because a lot of your work uses so many different. Uh, you mentioned it even at the end, like how it's basically involving um, low cost kind of materials and methods. And I'm wondering if you. And I know you push that out with the open source uh, versions of a lot of your software, but I'm wondering if there was maybe um, some application that emerged in that kind of open community that you had never thought of or you're really excited about. I imagine somebody's picked that up and you thought, we never thought of that. Has that happened yet or is it a little too early to um, talk about that? I wouldn't say with the, this project that I'm talking about, although what has happened is that there's, I think at least like four different schools, like Katie Bowen at Caltech started this and made, made it a class project for them to build a diffuser cam <laughs> because it's like linear systems and solving inverse problems. Um, and then a couple of other schools, like I know someone at CMU is doing it as their class project. So I never thought of it as an educational tool, but it has become that. Um, but some of our other stuff certainly has, like people have picked up some of, some of the phase imaging methods we did, people have, installed them and used them for new scientific applications that we never would have thought of. Um, and then we have some open source software that basically it allows you to control your microscope hardware um, in Python. So you can use all of these Python analysis toolboxes together with the hardware control toolboxes. And people have done some crazy stuff with that that's really exciting and interesting. And I don't totally understand all of it. Oh, Eli's got his hand up. Eli. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So at the very beginning of your talk, uh, you contrasted the uh, two approaches uh, for uh, uh, solving for this uh, fuzzy image and figuring out what the image was. And uh, one approach, you, you called it the physics approach, and was basically um, kind of like um, uh, in, uh, doing matrix inversion uh, as an optimization problem, and then you optimize by going down the path of steepest descent to get to an optimum. And then you contrasted that on the other hand with machine intelligence, 
which is informed right. by a lot of prior examples, but also even in machine intelligence, it's also kind of an optimization problem uh, because right. you have to figure out what all the matrix elements are and uh, you uh, try to match up the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the prior knowledge in, in, the, uh, in the machine intelligence. You try to get a perfect match uh, to at least uh, the, uh, the prior things that have been identified. So it's very fascinating that you found this kind of uh, middle ground. And I'm trying to, under, trying to understand uh, what, uh, uh, what is there about the middle ground because you have some machine intelligence, but to some extent you're just uh, solving an optimization problem. So uh, can you help, underst help us understand how, wh about this middle ground? It's very fascinating. Yeah, so I, I would think of it like, if you want to do the pure machine learning way of doing it, then like, what do you do? You have to set up a neural network. So what do you do? You just set up like the biggest one your computer can handle and then just learn a bajillion different things. But a bunch of those things you're learning might be useless or like a bunch of them might turn out to learn that they don't matter. Um, and so I like to think of the, the, the joint way of doing things as like you're setting up a neural network where like the structure is defined by the, like the, the physics based way of doing things. And so, um, so you kind of know that what you're trying to learn matters. Um, or so are I, you saying it's, it's sort of machine learning, but you put in a bias or a con constraint uh, or uh, what you call regularization uh, that corresponds to the uh, physical process um, yeah. So, and it, and the way it's encoded is basically like we took that, that like physical optimization and made it a neural network by making every iteration, a layer of the neural network. Um, and then you learn things like the hyperparameters, like the regularization parameter or um, like things that you can tune. And then you get to like a pretty good solution that will just be like, Basically, like what you should get from that is like the opt the best possible solution you could have gotten out of the physics based model um, if you had tuned it perfectly, but we can never tune it perfectly. So this does a good job of tuning it better than we do. But then you can like take that and, and put like like just like a unit, which is just a total standard neural network after it. And it will learn the stuff that you just didn't account for in your model at all. And that is like really exciting. And I think like this has been shown in a pretty recently people in computational imaging have been playing around with this. So um, uh, Michael Kelman and my group worked on this a lot and Christina did it for this application. Michael worked on kind of like this idea of unrolling your neuro unrolling your iterative algorithm into a neural network and how to make it computationally efficient. And people have been using that and it seems pretty standard to show that um, it works really well and it gets and like doing this like kind of like doing the physics-based model like as you go or in, like in process is a great way to get to a good, a good like starting point for like throwing it into one of these like generic neural networks. And then they do a much better job if they don't have to like figure everything out. And you can think of like, I don't know if this is a great, I always think of it like this, that like a lot of like convolutional neural networks have really small convolution kernels, but now you're talking about spreading stuff across the whole image. So you can imagine why it would take a lot of layers to fully represent what's happening. Whereas if you like told it it was a convolution and did the deconvolution and then tried to fix the convolution with a, with a, a more traditional network, then it, it would just like be more efficient. It would work better. Right, it's an interesting combination. And uh, I wonder, has the machine intelligence community uh, embraced this? Yeah, we got the idea from them. Okay. So um, yeah, so I think like the biggest challenge with it actually is that you're storing every iteration as a layer of the network. So this network is humongous. Like if you're trying to solve for 3D, you basically have to solve like every position in 3D at every iteration becomes like a node in your network. So uh, memory was the biggest issue that we ran into. And Michael Kelman, I don't have any slides on it, but Michael Kelman in my group kind of like figured out how to use like a trick of like reverse back propagation and he stole it from a, a neuroips paper from last couple years ago um, and it worked beautifully for like reducing our memory requirements by orders of magnitude such that we could do like real world scale problems before we were just doing like 32 pixels or something like that yeah it's, it's very interesting how the philosophy of deep learning has uh, uh, injected itself in a lot of uh, surprising <laughs> and unexpected places right
So you've got a couple more questions queued up here. Uh, Simak, I believe, uh, you, did you want to ask your question live? Is that okay? Sure. Sure. Um, hi, I have a much shorter question. Um, uh, the, 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 the light that you shine as, 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 like, as like your, your light source, have you, have you considered optimizing that or, or, its, or, or its properties or its, or its pattern? Yeah, um, that's a whole other talk. We do a lot of illumination pattern design. Um, so I don't talk about it here because all of this is fluorescence microscopy. And in fluorescence microscopy, you just have to hit it with whatever particular color of light that it's that causes it the fluorophore to excite. And then the fluorophore just emits in all directions, whatever other color, its emission wavelength color. And so fluorophores couldn't care less what direction the light is coming from, uh, or you could pattern it spatially. This is like structured illumination. We do work on this as well. I'm just not talking about it here. So in this case, we're only talking about like the detection side stuff, which um, and so we just flood illuminate with one particular color for the fluorescent stuff. But we have like other projects that do structured illumination. And then for like more coherent stuff, you can actually pattern the illumination wavefronts and do really cool stuff with it. Um, it's just like not applicable in this particular project. Do, do you think, uh, do you think it could be made applicable? Like, like, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned the flooding, the, the flooding case, if, if it was, if it was like not, not flooded, but, but somehow like, like in, injected with like, uh, with, with, with structure, do you think, do you think that, that, that would make a, make a difference or, or allow you to, to do, um, to, to, to do other things, to do other things? Yes. Um, probably the most popular way of doing super, super resolution microscopy is the structured illumination and every every microscope company has a commercial system doing that so it is extremely useful great okay um all right we'll move on uh bokar uh, great talk uh, laura so i had just a quick question so to um to one of your question what was the best uh, diffuser so it seems like your computation is returning a in the area of micro lens. So do, do we know why? Uh, I mean, what controls the number of micro lens? Yeah, the, uh, so it's really interesting. Um, and so uh, my grad student, Nick, convinced me of this. I didn't really believe him. But uh, it's basically like, uh, let me go back a little. So if you have this like caustic function, this is good because you have lots of high frequencies. And you have lots of spreading. So you get the you get the spread out that you need for multiplexing. And you have lots of high frequencies. These are what's going to determine your resolution. And they're all in random directions, which is good. So you're going to cover every possible direction. Um, so if you had a lens, then a point maps to a point. This is the best SNR wise. Um, because if you look at this diffuser, you've got also these all these areas in between that aren't totally black. And so those are basically like background. That's just a, like you're adding background to your signal, which is killing your contrast, which is bad. So mm -hmm. lens has the best contrast, but it's useless for multiplexing. And when you go off focus, if you're trying to do anything 3D, you can't get a point at every position in 3D mm -hmm. that's distinguishable from other positions in 3D. So um, yeah, so lens is not good for that reason. So then like, let's do some micro lenses. And, and the reason why micro lenses is because it's good to focus light into a, a big pile because one bright spike is good for SNR, but it's, you need to spread it across the whole image. So then you need to have like, so an array of micro lenses might be your next guess, but this has issues with periodicity because if you shift this pattern by exactly one period, you can't really tell the difference between these two positions. And people have actually used this before. And what they do is they just say, okay, make sure your field of view is smaller than this width. But that's like super wasteful. So we're saying like, let's use the whole field of view and just make a, a randomly spaced micro lens array so that when I shift it, it's still unique and distinguishable. Um, oh, interesting, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so then, uh, and then like how many do you need? Basically like uh, if you look at, so the range of depths we have here, we have a range of depths we would like to solve for. And basically what it comes out with, it's not exactly true, but basically what it comes out with is that if you take like, diffraction limited Z spacing across those depths. If there's 10 slices, 10 diffraction limited slices across those that range you want, it's probably gonna give you 10 micro lenses that it wants. And one will be focused to each, one will be focused to a different depth, each representing one of those planes. If you have low, really high noise, then it's gonna put more micro lenses for each depth, just to give some redundancy for the sake of SNR. 
Yeah, thank um, you. And that's what we're seeing. And as you change the object that you're trying to reconstruct, the, the optimal pattern changes. So you have to design for like a class of objects. Thank you. Great. Um, I think uh, Guanghan, did you have a question as well? Yeah. Yeah, I do have a question. Uh, thank you, Laura, for the great talk. And my question is, um, since the compressed sensing you have, like you're using, you're having like fewer pixels for each image and probably you will lose some information. So does that uh, make your imaging mode more sensitive to the motion, which is a common problem when you apply this to like leaving biological sample? And I was just curious, did you do anything to deal with the motion when you're doing the zebrafish imaging or for the small endoscope you implanted in the, in the animal? Yeah, so it doesn't make it worse. Uh, like the motion artifacts don't get worse because of compressed sensing, except that the noise performance is worse. So maybe that would make the noise, the motion artifacts worse. Um, uh, I believe that in the one with the zebrafish, that was Nico's project. That was really a long time ago. I believe he did do like just lateral registration. He didn't bother with axial, just lateral. And that was um, enough for that particular case. But it's definitely an issue. Um, Guanghan's starting a postdoc in my lab, so maybe she'll be interested. Yeah. <laughs> but this is where like, we are talking about all these space-time methods. This is one of the problems we need to solve with them. <laughs> okay, thank you. The, when I say yeah. space-time methods, I mean like we're trying to, instead of solving, taking one frame of 2D and solving for 3D, let's take a, a 2D video and solve for 3D plus time. And then we can add temporal constraints like regularizers in time that are like super uh, valuable for making better quality reconstructions. Yeah, makes sense. Very cool, thank you. Awesome. It's like hanging out in your cool group meeting and hearing all the great ideas <laughs> come, to, come to fruition here. I love it. Um, I'm not sure if I, I, I might have missed someone, so I apologize, but I think um, uh, I think I got most of the questions answered. I always feel like everything you do looks a little like magic to me because things just sort of appear out of no place. And so, not magic, it's science. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I still, I, I love the poetry in it. So, um, all right. Well, um, I think uh, we'll close out. Um, I want to thank uh, Laura for just not only being such an amazing colleague, but the brilliant work she does just up levels the entire Berkeley culture. So thank you. It's been great to have you as a colleague. I love seeing the work that you and your team have been doing. Um, and thank you all. We'll see you next week. We have another talk. Do you want to add anything, Eli? Uh, no, uh, thanks uh, to Laura again. It's terrific. A lot to think about. And uh, if I have questions, I'll send you emails. Okay. Thanks. This was fun.